of all my colleagues, I want to welcome you all and say happy unofficial start to spring. I've been doing this, or I've been coming to these for about a quarter of a century now, and over the years, this is sort of, in my mind at least, been sort of the official start to the, the new season, and if I've jinxed us by saying that and we get a blizzard in the next week, I'm really sorry. Um, I do want to share a few messages and thanks before we get started. Um, and. Uh, Sarah Loomis introduces tonight's speaker. First, um, tonight's event being streamed on Facebook and YouTube, so welcome to everyone that's tuned in remotely. If you'd like to know when to, the recording of tonight's event is available, the easiest way to do that is to sign up for our digital e-newsletter, our Digitalis, our, our um, electronic newsletter, and you can do that by going to our website, which is garden.smith.edu, and click on the News and Events tab, and you'll see a link to sign up there. Uh, for those of you that are here in the auditorium, I want to ask you to just take a quick second to notice where the exits are if for some reason we had to leave in an emergency, and in particular, draw your attention to this one, to my right, your left, uh, because that one is the shortcut over to Lanning Fountain and a great one to take after the event because, as always, you're all invited to come over to Lyman to get a first peek at the bulb show and see the collections all lit up. Um, if you do that, please, uh, we're going to be, uh, it'll be open until 9.30, so if you are taking your time there, and I hope you will, just be mindful of that, please. We have staff that will be closing up that it's been a very long day for, and we all want to get home to our loved ones. Um, while you're there, I also want to draw your attention to the work of five great students, um, student artists, I should say, Dan Dow, Avery Maltz, Yasmin Porath, Solosha Ray Tillman, and Finn Walsh. Uh, they've built works that are infused, again, like last year, into this year's show that are inspired by the theme of botanical imagination. I'd also like to recognize and thank certain colleagues uh, who did so much amazing work producing this year's Bulb Show and putting together tonight's events and sharing it with our community. First, Lily Carone, who was the primary organizer and architect of this year's show and coordinated the aforementioned art, student art collaboration with Professor uh, Lynn Yamamoto. I also want to thank her Lyman partners, Dan Babineau and Jimmy Grogan, uh, as well as Gabby Emmerman, Ben Green, Dave Dion, Andrew Ribello, Nate Sachs, Sherry Peabody, and students Giselle Greenberg, Allie Wernell, Sophia Holmes, Sophia Zucala, Amelia Nyer, Flora Meeker, and Meredith Jones for all, the, all of whom do, did so much work to make the show happen this year. It's a long effort and a lot went into it. Thank you also to Julie Thompson, our communications coordinator in the Smith ITS department for working so hard to promote this event and coordinating the streaming of tonight's event. And of course, to Sarah Loomis, uh, who produced tonight's event. Um, if you could just please give, join me in a round of applause to thank everybody for an effort that started last fall. I also want to thank our community of Botanic Garden volunteers for your help in welcoming our visitors and to the friends of the Botanic Garden of Smith College for your financial support. Uh, that supports a big part of why we are able to do the breadth of work we do and bring in amazing speakers here. Uh, if you're not yet a friend, joining is easy and you can do that through our website as well, again, garden.smith.edu. Uh, as a member, you receive a number of benefits, including 10% off merchandise at uh, the Botanic Garden gift shop, um, access to members only hours at the annual flower shows, which if you've ever been here on a weekend, you know what a big plus that is. Um, and you also get reciprocal entry into almost 350 gardens around the country, which is an easy way to earn back that donation in no time. Uh, so for more details, <laughs> um, uh, again, go to, to garden.smith.edu or you can ask at the front desk of Lyman. And um, lastly, before we get started, I just want to say how tremendously grateful I am to work in a community where we challenge ourselves and challenge each other to explore difficult spaces for the best reasons, um, where obviously the work we do here is on the unceded land of the Pocumtic and the Nonatuck and the work of scholarship, the scholarship uh, of people like Dr. Subramaniam gives us a framework not just to, um, to understand the harmful, harmful historical legacies, but to 
build meaningful steps towards restorative justice with indigenous people who are living in our community today and to act on those. Um, I feel so appreciative of the, the students and the colleagues um, I work with who really see the joy that is to be found in unlearning practices and thoughts and thinking that is, causes friction with the values that we hold so dearly. Um, and one of those wonderful colleagues is who I want to welcome up to the stage tonight to introduce today's speaker. Please join me in welcoming our manager of education, Sarah Loomis. Thank you, John. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I just love this event and I love kicking off the Bulb Show in such a meaningful way. Um, but I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Dr. Banu Sumarbamaniam, excuse me, is currently the Luella Lemire Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Wellesley College and was most recently based just across the river at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Banu is an interdisciplinary scholar, trained as an evolutionary biologist and plant scientist, and has since embraced tools from the humanities and social sciences to help shape the field of feminist science and technology studies. Banu explores the philosophy history, and culture of the natural sciences and medicine as they relate to gender, race, ethnicity, and caste. Banu's recent research rethinks the field of practice of botany in relationship to histories of colonialism and xenophobia and explores the wide travels of scientific theories, ideas, and concepts as they relate to migration and invasive species. Banu also continues to work on the relationship of science and Hindu nationalism in India. Banu is also the author of three books. These include Botany of Empire, Plant Worlds, and the Scientific Leg Legacies of Colonialism, Holy Science, The Biopolitics of Hindu Nationalism, which won the 2020 Michelle Kendrick Memorial Book Prize from the Society for Literature, Science, and the Arts, and finally, Ghost Stories for Darwin, The Science of Variation and the Politics of Diversity, which was the winner of the Ludwig Fleck Prize in 2016 for an outstanding book across the breadth of science and technology studies. Then it was also the co-editor of Feminist Science Studies, a new generation that put feminist science studies on the map and meet a transnational analysis which looks at human, plant, and animal relations and at the production and consumption of meat and its alternatives from the vantage of a wide range of interdisciplinary scholars working at the intersections of the sciences and humanities. I think it's very clear why we are so excited to have Banu here tonight, and I would invite you to please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hello, good evening, and thanks for coming out on a Friday night. And I guess we are all plant lovers. That brings us here. Can people hear me? I was told I should. Yes, all good. If I ever start um, getting too low, just put your hands up or yell. Um, because, you know, for our, um, our love of plants. And my love of plants is rather complicated, and part of what I want to do today is to talk a bit about how um, of that complicated legacy, and especially how I came to think about the history of science, which if there are any biology students here, they, they do not teach you that in biology classes. And so as I read about the history of botany and biology of how shocked I was, amazed I was, angry I was at all the things that you know I, I never studied. So I'm going to sort of um, you know sort of go through that. So starting, I grew up in India, um, in post-independent India, as an urban middle-class child, and which means that um, 
growing up in India, you grow up in these mythological worlds. You hear stories largely of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And these stories are filled with plant and animal life. Um, in, in a way, stuck here in not being able to move. But of, of plant and animal life, where um, they are both, um, it's mythology at, uh, on the one hand, but these creatures are alive and do all kinds of things. They talk, communicate with each other. Um, they can transform into inanimate objects, back into animals, into plants. And so it was a world where transformations and, the, and possibilities were endless. And that kind of magical possibilities where you weren't told that all oh, plants have to be you know, rooted, animals could move, but plants couldn't. But there were all kinds of possibilities there. And in the everyday, plants were very much part of life. You, know, you have a tummy ache. Someone would make you, uh, you know, boil ginger or, um, um, or cumin seeds if you had an allergy. So plants were very much part of everyday life. And then, of course, you hit age five or six, and you have to go to school. And you go to a school that is, uh, you know, Brit that the British left left for us. Um, and as an urban child, I went to English medium schools. And there, suddenly, you are introduced to um, poetry, British poetry, which you had to learn by heart. You uh, were introduced to the sciences, introduced to everything that you probably go into in to school here. And one of my fav favorite authors in, um, as I've explored this topic is Jamaica Kincaid. And she talks about a similar experience um, growing up in Antigua, um, also a, a, an ex-British colony. And she writes, in my child's mind's eye, the poem and its content, she was talking about being forced to study the daffodils and recite it, which I also had to. And the people through which it came were repulsive. I had no rational or just way of arranging and separating the people who created the things to memorize from the people who made me memorize wonderful things, whether they were about daffodils, heaven, and hell, or just the River Thames. Right? So a lot of what you studied in the classroom were not things that you experienced in everyday life or even expected to experience in everyday life. And there's a wonderful uh, moment in her novel, Lucy, where she, for the first time, um, encounters a field of daffodils you know, as an adult. And she writes, I wanted to kill them. I wish that I had an enormous sight that I would just walk down the path, dragging it along me, and I would cut these flowers down at the place where they emerge from the ground. And this sounds very violent, you know, of how one would treat gorgeous daffodils. And I actually only came to appreciate daffodils after experiencing a winter, you know, and so part of the joy of daffodils is to, is to see these flowers come up, which growing up in India where there is no winter, there, there was no context to it. Um, and then, so to me, in part, this sort of captures the kind of alienation that a post-colonial education really um, causes. So, you know, for me, a post-colonial education was an education in alienation from the real world. And so there was life on the ground, all the stories I'd studied, the everyday life in which things mingled. And then you go to school, and suddenly all those plants are Latinized. You have to learn a different language. And if you spoke a local language in school, you got reprimanded, right? So uh, you, you begin to see this divergence, life on the ground and life in, um, uh, in, in schools. And of course, you know, thanks to Linnaeus, all plant names are Latinized, um, and some of which resemble local places, but most often not. And the other thing I should also say, growing up in urban India, it's not that it is, you know, there was no, there, there were trees in the sidewalks, there were things that grew up in cracks, but it's not, I never had access to go into what we call wilderness or forests, right? So, the, so there's also that additional aspect to it. And so, you know, I come to graduate school uh, in the United States. Um, and um, again, to summarize a very large field, one of the best expressions I've heard about uh, graduate uh, education and especially scientific culture, and this, these are the words of Sharon Trawick, who is an anthropologist, who talks about scientific culture as the culture of no culture, right? So a culture that thinks it has no culture, how would it operate? 
And part of what um, it means is that there is no space for communicating in graduate school or in, in scientific um, contexts about life, about what's going on, about observations of who's speaking and who's not, who's being encouraged and who's not, right? So there's a lot happening within scientific culture, but there's no vocabulary or space within scientific culture to be able to talk about it or experience it or observe it. And so um, it's sort of within that context, coming straight from India to a graduate school here, there was a deep, I, I felt a deep sense of alienation and growing invisibility. And that was the time when I happened to meet the director of women's studies um, at the university I was at, and she told me, you do realize this is not an unusual story, don't you? That this happens to many people who feel marginal within the culture of science. And thanks to her, I began, began taking courses <clears throat> in women's studies and began developing a vocabulary of how the culture of science functioned. Um, began reading about the history and sociology of science. And these gave me the tools to understand the invisibility as not being about me, but about being about other things, right? About histories of science. And so I always highly recommend to any students uh, of how important interdisciplinary education is because it really gives you the tools to understand what is happening you know, in, in any field. Um, and so that got me introduced to this field we call feminist science and technology studies. Um, and very broadly, what the field tries to do is not to understand science as outside of culture, which is certainly what I was taught right through, but to understand science as within culture. That science is done by scientists who are embedded in a scientific culture, in a historical period, within particular contexts, and all those ideas and biases and histories shape the questions they ask, the methods they use, and the knowledge that they produce about the natural world. So understanding science and similarly understanding uh, humans as not separate from nature, but as within nature. And so when you look at the histories of scientific objectivity, you will see you know, histories of um, so many claims that were made that you know, have later been um, challenged. Um, and largely what scholars call this idea of objectivity, that somehow scientists enter a lab and you know, who they are, their histories, their biases remain, and they become these objective scientists in the lab or in the field, is, is a mythology, right? That we're bringing all these ideas with us. It's a God's trick. It's uh, thinking that this view from nowhere. And instead, what the field would suggest is that we would be better scientists if we were reflexive about where we came from, if we understood the histories we brought with us, if we understood the metaphors we use and where they come from, that rather that these contexts to, to our ideas, the histories that they come from, make us better scientists rather than uh, worse scientists. So rather than understanding science and society and nature culture as binary opposites, of understanding how ideas travel you know, between these different realms. OK, so I wanted to turn to, and so part of what, what this project did for me was beginning to think about the history of biology, in particular, um, thinking about the history of botany. And empire and European colonialism looms very large on these histories, something that I feel I was never taught. And so part of what I was doing in this new project is to think about the long arc of colonialism, right? And not only colonialism, the long arc of the planet. That at one time, the planet was one landmass, Pangaea, that then through tectonic forces, you know, split up into Gondwana land, all different, you know, arrangements, and then becomes the, the separate continents as we know it. And what historians of ecology um, point out is that what European colonialism did was uh, that colonists took their favorite plants and animals wherever they went, that in part it was a project of building new Europes wherever they went, right? So you need, needed, they needed tea gardens in India, they needed their favorite foods and um, you know, teas that they you know, drank there. Um, they brought agriculture, and with them they brought pests and germs, 
right? So it was really a profound transformation when you think about European colonialism. And one might call that the original bioinvasion. And the scale of movement of pl plants was so large that um, you know, we can think about it as a world-spanning world -spanning economic system where plants, animals, and people shuffle the globe. And in part, it re-knit the seams of Pangaea, right? And so when we think about invasive species, native and foreign species, it's often within, the, in, within a very narrow recent context. And when you draw those history back, uh, back further, we develop a very different understanding of the histories of botany and histories of plants. And in part, what colonialism did was really reshape how we think about the land and how we think about plants and animals. And here I find Leanne Simpson uh, very useful when she says, really what the colonizers have always been trying to figure out is how do you extract natural resources from the land when the peoples whose territories you're on believe that those plant, animal, and minerals have both spirit and therefore agency? And she answers, you use gender violence to remove indigenous people and their descendants from their land. Two, you remove agency from the plant and animal worlds. And three, you reposition land as a natural resource for the use and betterment of white people. And this is precisely what has happened in different parts of the world, where the local people were seen as uncivilized, where the resources, especially the bountiful spices in different parts of the, um, the world, became, um, so Amitabh Ghosh's recent book called Nutmeg's Curse, argues that every time you have riches within it, it is a curse because it brought the European colonists there in order to exploit it. And particularly the ways in which plant and animal worlds become these inanimate things, and humans too, that can become property, that can be bought and sold. So this was really what colonialism did, was really a disenchantment of the world, was a commodification of the world that allowed a certain, a certain kinds of trade routes, ways in which things moved around the world. And part of what I'm talking about is in part from this forthcoming book, Botany of Empire, which is coming out in April 2024. So to illustrate this, I want to use one example and that of invasive species uh, to make a case for, um, sorry, was it this? No, it was this, okay, okay. <laughs> um, to, to, to make a case for why we, how histories of empire shape the ways in which we think about native and foreign plants today and why the histories of empire might help us rethink um, how we should talk about them. So this work began as a, a project in botany, um, in ecology, working with two um, colleagues, Jim Beaver and Peggy Schultz at the University of California, Irvine. And we were looking at the relationship of native and foreign plants and their relationship with mycorrhizal fungi um, in the soil. And as I began reading both scientific articles and reading um, articles, you know, newspapers, of, and I was right in the midst of, I had just, you know, I'd started as a postdoc, I'd gotten my first um, job, and I was beginning to have this eerie resemblance of what was happening to me in my life and what was happening to the plants around me. And so anyone here who is, uh, has come as, um, um, I guess a foreigner, when you start, you start off as a non-resident alien, and then you become a resident alien, and then you can be naturalized when you get your passport. And these are precisely the language we use about plants as well. And you might be naturalized, but you will never be a native. You know, that's a very different category, and we'll, we'll talk about it some more. So really beginning to see how the worlds of humans and how the worlds of plants have this eerie resonance, right, uh, including how, how we talk about them when they enter a particular land. And similarly, this whole idea of what is nature in place and nature out of place, humans in place and humans out of place, of who is an alien, who is a refugee, who is a colonizer? These are all terms we use in plant worlds as well as in human worlds. 
Now, the idea of um, nature in place and out, out of place is um, um, a recent, in, well, recent in so far as early 19th century you know, um, invention, because there was no such concept before that. And um, it was a, um, a botanist called John Henslow in, uh, who was asked to chronicle the true British flora. And then when he was trying to chronicle them, he realized he needed to know what were not true British or what were false British flora. And hence came the idea of native plants and foreign plants. And um, historians of botany, as I talked about uh, uh, you know, before, um, you know, argue that if we are talking about colonialism or imperialism, we are really talking about ecological imperialism. The search for spices, the search for plants, and the production of plantation and plantation crops, the monocultures that uh, emerged from it, the ways in which resources were extracted from the colonies to aggrandize the um, colonizing forces was fundamentally done around um, um, you know, imperial formations. And even something like conservation biology has its roots in colonialism because I think the colonists realized that if we keep uh, extracting resources, then there'll be nothing left here. So how do we build an ecology where we can extract but also keep growing so we can keep extracting? So even conservation biology, which we think about as such a progressive field, has its roots in, in those kinds of colonial logics. So as I was saying, this idea of um, borders and native and foreign plants was quite new. So even um, the USDA in, you know, less than 100 years ago, sent off um, plant explorers to different parts of the world to find anything new and interesting, funny looking, beautiful looking, exotic looking. And so someone like David Fairchild himself brought more than 200,000 species into the plant. So these were times where plants were moved around willy-nilly across the world, from the colonies here, people exhibited orchids in their living rooms to show their you know, class status. And the American Acclimatization Society, someone suggested, why don't we introduce every bird named in Shakespeare's plays into Central Park? Well, why not? So they did, right? But it's just to give you a sense that this was a different time about the ways in which we thought about plants and things were moved around um, you know, very, very easily. And then you begin to see um, as you know, um, independence movement begin in different parts of the world, you begin to see the borders being sealed in Western nations. So within in the US, you see the Chinese Exclusion Act which is one year after the state's quarantine law. So again, it's a very nature cultural world. What's happening in nature is happening in culture. What we're doing with humans is happening with plants and animals as well. And after the Chinese Exclusion Act, we begin to see you know, entry of different European groups and finally you know, all European immigrant groups. And so again, it's a nature cultural world. What happens to plants happens to humans. Now, the field of invasion biology usually is credited to Charles Elton in his uh, 1957 book, uh, The Ecology of Invasions. And invas invasive species, by definition, have to be foreign species. Um, even though native species might grow uncontrollably, they can't, cannot be called um, invasive species. And I want to give you a brief um, survey about how we talk about invasive species. So this is a children's book. Exotic invaders, killer ants, and other alien species are infested America. We start very, very young um, with this kind of language. Tinkering with Eden. The idea that there was an idyllic Eden before all these foreigners came and transformed um, into this impure land. The language of battles and wars as a way of how one deals with plants and, um, uh, plants and animals. Um, the, you know, the color schemes I love about you know, the, the red and yellow everywhere, how they are, you know, they are threatening um, the sanctity of the country. Um, they always look very alien and weird, you know, with big eyes that they are watching, you know, that sense of surveillance. 
And what has been particularly interesting, I've been doing this for the last 20 years, is to watch how as things happen within the larger landscape of the country, happens with plants and animals as well. So after 9-11, how the language of home, homeland security transforms into beginning to think about biosecurity. Um, and the heart of the problem is always a borderless world, is, is globalization and the borderless world. So the solution is about enacting and enforcing borders. So here are some headlines from newspapers and magazines. Do you see anything in common here? Who do you think is the creepy strangler climbing, climbing Oregon's least wanted list? Any guesses? Not kudzu? Bittersweet. Not bittersweet? No? No? English ivy, that's right. right. So what was really striking to me as I was looking at these different headlines is nothing tells you there about plants or animals, right? So these headlines were always some generic fear of the outsider, of the foreigner, and then you read the article and then it'll be about English IV, about you know, this particular plant. And so again, the similarities when they talk about human alien threats and plant alien threats, they all merge into a broad xenophobic fear of the foreigners. And so looking across, plant and animal, there were, very, there were a lot of similarities in the ways in which we talk across species about the foreign. They're unhygienic, they look weird, they're taking over everything, they're stealth destroyers, they grow very fast, and that's again the classic figure of the third world female oversexed reproducer, right? They're indestructible, there's always fear of cross fertilization uh, and uh, miscegenation, they're here to stay, they're ecologically destructive, and they come in unlawfully. So again, the parallels were really striking as I was reading across these different fields. To um, make this point I was talking about earlier, there was a recent paper that looked at the different co European colonial empires, looking at British, Dutch, French, Spanish, and the plants that they introduced in the colonial nations, and then they went and surveyed them recently. And what they argue is that those colonial um, plants that were brought there are the plants that exist now. And there is a similarity between the different British colonies, which are different than the Spanish colonies, which have a similarity, right? So you can see firsthand as botanists um, uh, survey these different lands, that European colonialism has had a profound Im impact on the botany of different countries, and those colonial influences remain today, right? But when we talk about invasive species, we rarely mention colonialism or what uh, the influences of colonialism. Um, instead, we you know, talk about the you know, what mile of wine plant, and so Karen Cardozo, who is again a scholar in, in the Valley, and I um, wrote a paper talking about these as invited in invasions. And that's because a lot of invasive species have histories that are inflected by humans. So take something like the kudzu, right? It's a member of the pea family. It's a, it's a much revered and useful plant in Japan. It's seen as very versatile. Um, it's eaten as food, made into baskets, into medicine. In 1896, it was introduced in, um, in one of the world's fairs, and uh, American biologists got very interested in it because it was a legume, it fixed nitrogen, and that it could be very good for erosion control. So they paid farmers per hectare to plant kudzu. And of course, kudzu had very different idea of what it did here compared to Japan. It just, it, it grew, right? And um, 
so, and now we call it mile a minute plant, a foot a night vine. It's seen as a major menace. But it's only when I was delving into these histories that I understood the, you know, of how kudzu is an invited invasion. But now we just talk about this as an evil plant, as a dangerous plant, as a nuisance, without talking about the human intervention that brought them here. Take something like the Asian carp. It was brought as a worker fish to help clean up um, the, great, you know, the, um, the Mississippi River, and then it took over. And the irony today is that the Asian carp is overfished in China, where it's a delicacy to be eaten. Here, it's not eaten. And so now, the, there's a company, I think in Illinois, that was collecting the carp and fishing it back to China. But again, you begin to see these imbalances, right? One part, part of the world um, sees it as a resource, uses it. Another part doesn't know. But we do not change our ways. Um, you know, we're each stuck you know, within the histories that we, um, that, you know, that we have inherited. And so again and again, a lot of the invasive plants that we have and invasive insects that we have have these kinds of histories of the ways in which um, humans played a role in bringing them here, in initiating their growth, and then they become uncontrollable. But the solution always is to name them as evil, to name them as um, difficult. And we are beginning to see this trend with an environmentalism where people are very impatient by the level of change. And so we you know, have, for example, the, um, the green patriots who think environmentalists should arm themselves. And just like what is happening in the borders with respect to humans, we need to arm ourselves as environmentalists. Right after 9-11, when we are told that if we see anything suspicious, we should report it about humans, we do the same thing about plants and animals, right? We're supposed to take our cameras, take a picture of whatever um, we are fear fearful of and send it to the government. What is really astonishing in all of this is what we mean by native and alien. And when in the United States we talk about native, we are really talking about the white settlers, not the original inhabitants or Native Americans. And so to me, that makes the irony so poignant about the vitriol and anger, anger with which we talk about foreign species and invasive species, which both ignores the history and also ignores what is native um, and how things came to be native. And it is histories of settler colonialism in this country that makes something native. In telling you all this, my point is not about saying we don't have ecosystem damage, that there is an, um, e an, an, you know, an ecological, um, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than a problem, but I don't want to use apocalyptic language, that, you know, that there are s things seriously, um, um, this is seriously wrong, lots of things that we need to attend to. But I will still maintain that the problem is not these species themselves. The problem is the conditions uh, of our land policies, of our development policies, of our overdevelopment policies, that very often these are species that do very well in damaged land. And it is our land policies and um, uh, development policies that you know, clear cut so much that create damaged land on which certain species thrive. And rather than focus on these proximate causes of development, of um, sort of unchecked capitalist growth, the solutions become these dangerous species. And very often, conservation groups will have, you know, come spend your Saturday along the Charles River pulling out the species or that species. And I would still maintain these are two these are not solutions for the greater problems that we face. And we should look at those histories of colonialism, tell the stories about foreign and native plants differently. Another quick example about, again, these legacies um, that we live with is <clears throat> about sexual biology. And I quote from Landa Schiebinger, 
Hermaphroditic plants castrated by unnatural mothers, trees and shrubs clothed in wedding gowns, flowers spread as nuptial beds for a verdant groom and his cherished bride. Are these memoirs of an 18th century academy of science or tales from the boudoir? And she basically says both. And there's been a lot of work done on the history of botany and why it is we talk about plant reproductive biology in ways that sound very much like us. And in part, Shibinga argues that the scientization of botany happened about the same time as the sexualization of plants. And so the scientific revolution and the revolution in sexuality and gender came today. So that plant sexuality became a central focus in botany. And so when, um, especially Linnaeus was um, you know, naming his plants, plant sex became very central. And not only plant sex, um, so in his Systema Naturae, he used the, uh, it was founded on the idea of the marriage of the plants. And not only were they male and female, they were actually husbands and wives. So you have Andrea and Gynia, right? So they were, you would have some plants that had two husbands, nine wives, and three husbands and six wives. And in fact, there were some who called them very lewd and pornographic and were very upset at the kind of uh, pornographic imagery uh, and imagination he was bringing to botany. And if you look at the, um, the, the parts of the plants that we name, there is a direct um, and a corollary between human uh, reproductive parts and plant and animal parts, right? So if you have the anthers, they are the testes. The pollen are the seminal fluid. So each one has its corresponding. And this was very, very intentional because he imagined the flower as a nuptial bed and about husbands and wives reproducing um, sort of within it. And when any of you who have observed plants or who have start, um, learned plant reproductive biology will realize that plants are really, really interesting. They do lots of very different things in order to reproduce. And this is a very, very limited vocabulary we have forced the diversity of plants into. And so, of course, we can't just say male plants and female plants. We have to come up with terms. Androdioecious if they only have male plants. Gy gynoecious if they have only female plants. Androdioecious if they have male flowers and some and bisexual and others. Gynodioecious if they have hermaphrodite flowers and fl um, female flowers and separate plants. Androgynomonoecious, andromonoecious, gynomonoecious, polygamodioecious, polygamomonoecious, subdioecious, subgynoecious, trimonoecious, trioecious. I'll stop here. But you get the picture. Right? We have to invent all these terms because we are trying to put plants into the limited imagination of Victorian sex lives. And to me, you know, these are both with respect to invasive species in here. This is the work that remains you know, before us, is that how do we you know, actually observe what it is plants do? So even, for example, with respect to invasive species, there are biologists who argue that not every uh, foreign plant is likely to become invasive. It depends on certain life history traits, how they disperse their seeds or pollen, how far the dispersal distances are. And if you look at these various life history traits, only some plants might become invasive. So if we throw away the vocabulary of native and foreign and focus on the biology of plants, we can attend to what is happening in the environment without using these kinds of xenophobic vocabularies. Similarly, if we threw away, which I would argue we should, questions of sex and gender for plants, you know, move to what plants are actually doing, that they're pollen parents and seed parents and um, you know, working through the biology of plants, we might come up with much more interesting and imaginative and more accurate descriptions of botany and plants, plant worlds, and maybe the um, um, promiscuous possibilities of plants might inspire us to be more imaginative about human sexuality as well. <laughs> and so I just want to um, <clears throat> conclude with that when you look at the history of, um, for the love of plants of what we have done. It's a rather colonial history that is 
about profit, is about producing plants to please humans, things that are more showy, more beautiful. Um, and you know, this is you know, the part of the enterprise you know, we're all here in today. But if one focused more carefully about botany and plants, Every, you know, you talk to any person who loves a particular plant, a species of plant, they'll tell you what's interesting about them. And every plant is interesting in its own way. And in part, we drift towards the showy ones because th those are the easiest to see, right? But if we will all um, take time to understand the biologies of various um, organisms, much more marvelous worlds are ahead of us. And so rather than delve into, um, uh, stay in colonial biology and legacies of colonial biology, um, we can learn to think historically, sociologically, and much more interdisciplinarily. There's a wonderful term called agnotology in my field, which is the, uh, is the study, of, study of ignorance. And it's not only that I don't know, I was purposefully made not to know. Right? The fact that botanists will not be taught history and that historians will not be taught botany, it's set up so that we do not understand and we are never taught about these histories. And so ag agnotology to me is not accidental. The disciplinary formations in the university where only each one will study their own specialization is not incidental. It produces a world where we are really, really removed from the world outside of us. And so when we understand these histories, we might produce a more self-reflexive, self-critical, and historical biology, where humans are not outside of nature, but part of nature. And so very often to me, the conservation, the solution becomes, oh, we should just push all the humans out and the world will be okay. It's like, no, humans are part of nature. You know, we were part of you know, creating what we have created, and we can create different worlds as well. We need to find um, you know, that role there. It's always interesting to me that it's always mother nature, but we always dominate mother nature. But the, all the principles in ecology, competition will trump um, collaboration or mutualisms, right? So it's somehow nature works in patriarchal ways, even as nature is feminine. Also always asking this question of terms like the Anthropoc Anthropocene, who is the Anthropos there, right? Who are the people that produce the world we live in? Who are the peoples that gained money and development? When colonization not only developed colonial nations, it underdeveloped colonized nations. And so we need to reckon with those histories when we um, look ahead. We need to decenter the human, but this is not a question about individuals. It is about systems of botany and sociology all of these are systems that, um, that colonial legacies have shaped. We should refuse binaries and think nature culturally. I don't believe we can ever decolonize, but I think we must begin to think about how colonial legacies um, shape our worlds today. Um, and much of what I've been talking about are really about ideologies of sex and gender and race and class and sexuality that have shaped these worlds. And so th we must work to dismantle them. And finally, we need to figure out how we live entangled lives with the world around us, not in um, a relationship of domination or exploitation. I think I will stop there and I'm happy to take any questions, qu criticisms, challenges. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> there. Uh, okay, I'll keep it a little further away. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Subramaniam. I'm recalling uh, from earlier today um, the Jamaica Kincaid daffodil example you gave. It came up in a discussion group with students. I was so happy to see you uh, bring that to us tonight. Um, and it um, makes me think, as, as uh, Tim Johnson always did um, in the past uh, bulb shows, uh, open up the questions to students first, if they're Smith students.
He'd like to. If you do have a question, please wait till I bring the microphone so that uh, folks who are tuned in remotely can hear the question as well. Thanks. Um, hi. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for blessing us with this delightful talk. It really spoke to my heart and what I'm passionate about, and I was just enraptured by everything you had to say. Um, but in terms of my question, I am actively studying um, plant mycorrhizal interactions and the way that plant migration impacts those, and I'm very interested in the research that you've conducted with the Beaver Schultz Lab and your studies of mycorrhizal interactions um, among and between native and non-native plants. And I was just wondering from that work um, if you noticed whether you know, the competition between native and non-native plants impacted the mycorrhizal mutualisms that were being formed and if that impacted the local environment in any way because as I'm actively carrying out this research, I have yet to reach any conclusions or any conclusive results. And I just love to hear from others in the field. Thank you. Thanks for those kind words. Um, in terms of those experiments in the species that we studied, um, it was impossible to say native plants did this, uh, exotic plants did that. So there was a great deal of variation in how individual plants interacted with mycorrhizal uh, fungi and the kind of feedback loops they produced. Um, and so again, um, I think to me what I left with is that these are terminologies that are not useful of talking about native plants and, you know, and, and foreign plants. Um, the other thing is um, that very often when um, we talk about restoration biology, or which is a term we, we can talk about if you want, but, um, and about um, native plants, we very often ignore the soil, right? That we can take any native plants, plonk it down in the ground and it should grow rather than recognizing these co-evolved histories within it. And so that's what I love about the Beaver Schultz lab is sort of paying attention to that. And, that, uh, and again, of, you know, treating um, the life cycles of plants and that they don't, they're not just by themselves, they interact with complex communities. And so, I mean, I'm glad you're doing this work, but again, I think it's not a, there isn't a blanket answer across all native species or foreign species and that we need to be more attentive. Um, thanks. Yep. Up here. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was just wondering if you've seen any particularly successful efforts in um, like certain labs or university departments to try to counter the idea of scientific culture being a cultureless culture and the idea of a view from nowhere. But I've seen good examples of the scientific culture being not being the uh, culture of no culture. I think there are you know always pockets, right? There are always um, really good labs. Um, um, I think. Um, enlightened or progressive um, lab directors who work with students. So for example, uh, I don't know if there's a recent, came out last year called Pollution is Colonialism by La uh, Max Liberon, who is a um, um, biologist in the um, University of New Finland. And I think they've also published other papers where they outline how the lab is, how the lab works, right? How um, if you wash the dishes, that's a contribution to the lab. You know, the experiments couldn't have done without the, everyone's labor in that lab. So how do we uh, account for everyone's labor in the lab? How do we share power? How do we share accountability? How do we share, share ethics? And um, there's a journal called Catalyst. It's called, I think it's Feminism, Technoscience. Feminism Theory Technoscience. It's, and um, Max has a, an article in that where it's, it's outlining how the, the sort of the, the, the rules of the lab or the, I, I don't want to use the word rules, shared understanding you know, of the lab. And um, there's a wonderful um, bio, uh, behavioral ecologist at the University of Colorado, Ambika Kamat, who has also done this um, in her lab. And so we are beginning to see um, labs across um, the country 
where scientists are taking these questions seriously. They are bringing it to the fore in the lab. The lab is collectively deciding how they want to run, how they want to operate. Um, what, um, what might happen if someone has a problem in the lab, right? So I think that there are a lot, we're beginning to see lots of different examples. And where in some websites, you, there's also Bala Chaudhary in, at uh, Dartmouth. If you go to their websites, it will tell students coming in, this is who we are, and this is how we work together. And so you come in with that shared understanding. And if you don't agree with that, maybe you should work in a different lab. But so, so yes, I, th I think we're beginning to see that. And it's just wonderful to see. Well, I'm going to the next person. I want to let the remote audience know, too, that uh, if you type in questions, those, uh, Julie can get those to me as well. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, great uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, and as I peel back the layers of the onion of my own uh, understanding of how seeped patriarchy is into our culture and sciences, I see a lot of resistance to science as a, a, a symbol of patriarchy, <clears throat> but I worry about the scientific method. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the, the purity of that or the importance of that, does that evolve? Does new discussions about how to you know, use the, the method? Um, one of the things I felt I learned during COVID is what a poor job we do. Um, I don't want to talk about educating the public or the ways in which we have shared what it is science is about. So I think more scientists would say, this is the theory, this is the explanation I have today based on the data I have. Tomorrow you give me a different set of data, um, I will rethink this. And that scientists don't ex expect fields to be static, that it's not going to look the same 100 years from now, right? That that, that, that is part of science. And I remember during COVID where as um, we learned more and more about the virus, as the protocols of what we should do to be safe changed, um, that became an indication that, oh, scientists don't know what they're doing. Yesterday they said, wipe the, you know, the counters. Today they're saying, it, you know, you can't do that. Now they're saying you mask. Now they're saying don't mask, right? And similarly with various kinds of medical protocols. And I think it's in part because there's a way in which scientists have claimed to be that oracle and gotten a great deal of power in claiming that oracle. And this was a moment where that history, I think, came back to bite us. Um, so, so I think we need to um, be much more transparent about how science operates. Um, it is also clear from the history of science that the scientific method is not a method that keeps away bias um, or um, you know, cultural predilections of various kinds. Um, so um, when you think about, for example, the histories of sex or gender or race or sexuality, science is central to it in, in helping sh you know, show those categories. But for example, Dorothy Roberts would argue it is not that we had race and that race produced racism. There was racism, and we had to produce the idea of race to shore up you know, those. And so part of what colonization brought on was the production of certain kinds of categories that could become biological categories. That became the rationale for how we treated different groups of people differently. And so, I mean, this is all the scientific method. And so, which is why I sort of feel an interdisciplinary education and understanding histories and understanding how power functions is so, so critical for scientists because it will make us question more and produce better categories and theories and more reflexive practices and knowledge. I have one, one last question in the back. Hi, 
Hi. So Hi. I'm like a, a geology and paleontology student, and um, like my paleo professor had us read this really interesting paper about how like conservation efforts are undertaken with the idea of getting back to like some predetermined state and how a paleo biological perspective completely changes our idea of what is like natural for an area. And I was really struck by how you talked about like systems of taxonomy only being a few hundred years old and also how you like correlated that natural like beginning state with the tightening of borders. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about how different time scales impact how you think about things and maybe even how like a deep time perspective could play into a great idea of creating new things. So I, I think that different histories help you uh, understand different kinds of questions. So I think uh, part of the history I was telling you was specifically thinking in terms of what we talk, we talk about native and foreign plants and invasive plants. So I think the history, I mean, there's a lot of very interesting work done on, you know, paleontology and the ways in which those come to bear in how we think about um, humans and who humans are today. And sim similarly, uh, you know, the deep history of time and how we think about what a species is, you know, what that category is, what we mean by an organism. Um, but I, I think, so, so I, I agree with you. I think there are lots of interesting histories there that open up a lot of different questions in contemporary biology. But I don't know that, I, currently I don't know that that deep, deep history is helping here. So, I, I, so to me, the history that I draw on for these questions um, is, is colonial history. Because that's where these lang this language comes from. Thank you so much. Noting the time, uh, we'll uh, have that be the last question, but Dr. Subramanian is going to be down for a short time at Lyman, uh, and I hope you all join us down there. Uh, one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Christmas Eve